talking to Pepper last night, and he said to tell you hello. <laughs> I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. Um, but it's really terrific to be here with all of you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for the invitation, Suzanne, to come and speak to all of you. Um, I think that very many of you don't know me, and so I'd like to tell you a little about me so you know why I'm running for lieutenant governor and why I think I would be the best nominee um, to represent our party in the November election. I grew up in an Air Force family, and we moved to Arlington, Virginia when I was in the fifth grade and in my fifth school. I am the mother of four grown daughters who are 24 to 34, and my third daughter, Cassie, is an Air Force officer. And I'd love to share a story about her. It was one of the most heartwarming things I've heard and kind of difficult to hear as a mom at the same time. When she was at the University of Virginia, she was in the ROTC program and commissioned the day before she graduated. She was home for a holiday one, one day, and we were at the dinner table. We were talking about her future career as an Air Force officer, and she said to me, you know what, Mom? I'm ready to die and willing to die for my country. Well, that's not something a mom wants to hear out of her daughter's mouth, but I was so proud that I raised my daughters to love their country so much that one of them would want to serve in that capacity. I graduated from the University of Virginia back in 1978, with a degree in mathematics, so I'm very analytical and very much a problem solver. That's how I like to approach everything, <coughs> which really came in handy when I was in the legislature. And I know that your legislators here understand all you do is solve problems all the time. It's, it's your number one goal and mission when you're in the General Assembly. I started as a, as a party volunteer. I was really trying to figure out how to break into the Republican Party, so I wrote a letter to our Republican Committee Chair in Fairfax County, And, and in my letter, it was before the internet, it was way long ago, I said to him, I'd really like to volunteer. Please call me and let me know how I can become active. And he never, res he never responded to my letter. And that chairman was our current chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia, Pat Mullins. So there you go. But I was volunteering at my daughter's school, and another mom was there that I didn't know. Her husband came in, and they started talking about the upcoming campaign and, and how they were going to volunteer. So I walked up and said, which party are you affiliated with? And when they said Republican, I knew I had finally found an entree into my own Republican committee. Next thing I knew, I was standing out in the freezing cold in front of Wolf Trap Elementary School, passing out literature for the Alan <coughs> Ferris Gilmore ticket. So that's how I got my start. I became the Magisterial District Chairwoman for my uh, Magisterial District in Fairfax County, um, which was the most Democrat district. We would go out and door knock every single Saturday looking for those two or three Republicans that we just knew lived in every one of those precincts. And we were pretty successful in finding them. In 1997, I ran for the House of Delegates and was elected to represent a district that is so Democrat that it had a 17-point Democrat generic. Um, I never, I was in the House and the Senate, I always represented a district that had about 25% Republican. And so it was very challenging district to represent. Um, I won three terms in the House, and in my third term, I served as the Majority Whip and have the distinction of being the only Republican woman in the history of the General Assembly to ever be elected into a top leadership position. After leaving the House, I went to the State Senate for a term for four years, um, where I served as Chairwoman of the Rules Subcommittee. And while I was in the Senate and after the two years following, I was a partner in a small technology consulting firm. I'm very much a part of the technology industry in Northern Virginia. And when Governor McDonald was elected, he asked me to serve in his cabinet. So for the past three years, I've been directing Governor McDonald's Washington office. <coughs> and oftentimes, people will ask me, why, do you want to, why are you running for lieutenant governor? And I like to say, if you have spent the past three years watching this administration in action, you too would be incentivized to run for public office, um, as we really need folks that understand what's going on in Washington to run for and win office in Virginia and really around the nation to try to make a dent in what this administration is doing. And I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just telling you some of the things that I observed when I was wa running that Washington office. I left the governor on September 7th so I could campaign full time. This commonwealth is huge, as Suzanne knows, and you really can't do um, a campaign justice statewide if you're not doing it full time. I think it's very difficult um, to, to be able to visit all the places that you need to. You know. After working three years and watching the Obama administration using regulation and executive order to circumvent the legislative branch to instruct the Department of Justice not to enforce laws that have been passed, um, no, he clearly does not understand, well, he understands it, he just doesn't want to comply with the Constitution. And that is our greatest challenge with this president, as we all know. Um, of course, as a constitutional, um, 
someone that, that clearly understands the Constitution and has always followed it. As a member of the General Assembly, it's the oath that I took when I was sworn into office and when I became a cabinet member. Um, I would say that the Tenth Amendment has become very clearly important to me, having run that Washington office and having had to work against this Obama administration and all that they do to encroach on states' rights. And I think we're all familiar with the unfunded federal mandates that both Congress and the administration tend to pass down, which really, really take help. It really makes it difficult for state budgets and local government budgets because so much of more every single year is being eaten up by these federal mandates. We really don't have as much money to provide the services that we need to. But the encroachment on states' rights is really amazing. And one of the examples I like to give is education, number 12 education. The Elementary Secondary Education Act, which we call the ESEA, has been up for reauthorization for the past couple of years. And my office's obligation was to go to the Hill and work with committee staff on the language in that bill. The Obama administration really loves the Common Core standards. And if they're able to get that through, then every state would have to teach what the Obama administration dictates and in a manner that they want to. Well, after working with committee staff on the Republican side, both in the House and the Senate, I think what the agreement will be is to not use that language and just say that high school graduates need to be college or career ready, which of course can mean anything. It's very broad language. And it then allows the states to determine what they want to teach, how they want to teach it, what the curriculum in their public schools will be. Um, I also like to talk a little about um, Workforce Reinvestment Act. That is the money that comes to us from the feds that the states spend for workforce training and development, which is important in areas with high unemployment. If we don't retrain us and create a skilled workforce, then they just aren't going to have a much more difficult time finding jobs. Well, two-thirds of the dollars that come to states from that reauthorization would go directly to governors for them to spend as they see fit. Because governors know where their high employment areas are. They've been very innovative in creating workforce retraining and development programs so that they can create a better and more skilled workforce. Well, the Obama administration wants to take two-thirds of those dollars and place them in a discretionary fund. This is my experience with the Obama administration and discretionary spending. If the Obama administration gets to spend the money, they send it to the states with Democrat governors. So they're taking money from those of us that pay taxes in states with Republican governors, and they just go ahead and, and give it to the Democrats. And a purple example of this is the Race to the Top program. Unfortunately, our Congress allowed this president to have billions of dollars for race to the top, and this is what we saw. In the grant application, you have to be willing to accommodate the Common Core standards, which I just told you is not the way that Republicans would want to see education run. And so I said to Governor McDonnell, I don't think we can apply for these grants because the Common Core is embedded in the grant application. And he agreed, so he did not apply. Well, the states that did win those awards, the vast majority had Democrat governors. And then the Obama administration decided that they wanted to do race to the top for pay for wage five. And what they need to do with our baby infants in the education system, I have no idea. I think it's just preposterous. But they awarded 10 grants, nine of them to states to Democrat governors, one to a state with a Republican governor. And we know they did that so they could call it bipartisan. But that's what we've been witnessing in Washington, and it just has to stop. One of the things, and, I, and, and um, Dr. You talked about this when you talked about E.W. Jackson, there are two obligations of the lieutenant governor in the statute, Virginia statute. One, of course, is to preside over the state senate. And I would say that any seven of us, if having to split a tie vote, would, of course, vote with the Republicans. Um, I would say that about the current lieutenant governor, but he seems to be going in a different direction, and he can do that twice this session, which was very disappointing. <laughs> But I think you can hold the rest of us accountable for that, and, and we would very much be with our Republican principles. But the second obligation in the code is if something should happen to the governor and he is unable to fulfill his responsibilities, you become the next governor. And one of the, one of the things that I think distinguishes me from the others is this. I am the only candidate for lieutenant governor who has not only served in the legislature and as a leader in the legislature, but I've served in the executive branch. Governor McDonald has a cabinet meeting every Monday morning. We are required to write a cabinet report every Friday afternoon and read these reports. So I'm the only person running who really knows what goes on in the governor's office, what our departments and agencies are currently doing, how they overlap with one another, and most importantly, I'm the only candidate with that direct Washington experience who clearly understands 
every nuance of what this Obama administration is doing, what Congress is doing, and how that directly impacts our states. And so I think I am the best position and the most experienced person in all of the areas necessary to be a good lieutenant governor. And I'll tell you, I'm running because I feel that after 15 years serving in these various areas, I am now at a point personally where I know I can take on this awesome responsibility and do a very good job. And I know that some of those that are running are running against you know, career politicians, as they call it, call it. But I know that you support Ken Piccinelli. And the reason Ken is ready to be governor is because he's served in the state senate for eight years. He's been our attorney general. He has worked very hard. He's garnered experience. He understands policy. He knows what the Congress is up to. He knows what this president is up to. And he's ready to fulfill those responsibilities. And like Ken, I have that same type of experience that I think puts me above the other six. The second thing that I want to talk with you about is electability. We know that we lost this election last year because we did so poorly in Northern Virginia. And let me give you some statistics. You cannot win statewide as a Republican in the Commonwealth of Virginia unless you can win Northern Virginia with 46% of the vote or better. We've known that for election after election, and it was really exemplified the outcome of this last November's election. Governor Romney lost Fairfax County by 120,000 votes, and he lost in Northern Virginia by over 200,000 votes. And Governor Allen did even worse. And so we went back and analyzed why we had such tremendous losses up there. Some of it is transplants from the Mid-Atlantic and New England states, but we did very poorly with our ethnic voters. As a matter of fact, we did worse with Asians than we did with Hispanics, which very much surprised us, because Korean and Vietnamese voters tend to vote Republican. Now there's a lot of reasons that that happened, but I think that the best way I can describe it is this. When I did my press tour around the Commonwealth in November, I went to El Tiempo Latino and the Korea Times to interview with them, and you know what they told me? They told me that Obama and Payne bought paid advertising in their newspapers every day from Labor Day to Election Day. They reached out to the Romney and Allen campaigns and asked them to do the same, and they said, no, we can't afford it, we won't do it. And so our ethnic <coughs> voters in Northern Virginia saw Obama and Payne's name every single day during the election season in their newspapers. They heard their name every single day on the radio stations. They never saw Romney or, or Allen. And so, of course, they don't really fully understand where the parties are and who, which party that they should be affiliated with their conservative values, but they do know who engaged them, who took the time to let them know that they cared about them. And that's a large part of the reason why we did so poorly. Well, I'm very proud to tell you that I have the support and the endorsement of every Republican <coughs> leader in Northern Virginia. We have already collected filing forms for hundreds of Hispanics, Vietnamese, and Koreans, and with more and more coming in every day. I'm also supported by the Filipino community in Virginia Beach, the Indian community in Richmond, and uh, so many others. I have a black pastor in Stafford County who's supporting me. I have the um, two black members of the Enrico GOP supporting me. I have got the ethnic leaders and the ethnic support. And this is very important because I believe that if we engage our ethnic voters by bringing them to the convention, when they hear our platform, they will know that they're not Democrats, they're Republicans. I know that they'll be warmly welcomed and that, and that, um, and the success that the Obama campaign had dividing ethnic voters from the Republican Party, going as far as to say that Republicans are racist and they hate you. I know that when they come to our convention, when they're warmly welcoming, when they know that they have commonality with us, that they will go home and say, you know what, we're Republicans. And they will share that within their communities and with their families. And that is how we're going to engage and bring back those votes that we lost in the last election. I also want to touch upon a couple of issues that I think are very important to you, and that is this. First, I am 100% pro-life, and I don't just stand and say that to you. I have a 100% voting record in the General Assembly all 10 years I was in. Planned Parenthood had legislation that they wanted to have passed in every legislature around the nation. Mary Margaret Whipple carried it in the state, in the state legislature. Both two, the last two years I was in the House and the, two years, the first two years I was in the State Senate. And although I represented the Democrat district in the State Senate, I was the only Republican and the only pro-life woman in the State Senate. And so the guys asked me to handle the bill. Got out of health and education and it came to the Senate floor. And it was me who passed out and, represent, and, and sponsored the floor amendment that in essence killed that bill two years in a row. Because of my work in the life movement, the Susan B. Anthony Fund, which only contributes to pro-life candidates, typically women, 
um, bundled to me when I ran both times in the Senate because of my 100% pro-life voting record. Now, I represent a Democrat district, but I would not compromise those principles. I also voted for the marriage amendment, which failed in my district. But I'm here to stand before you by saying, in a locality with Fairfax, like Fairfax County, that is so liberally leaning, and in a district that was clearly a liberal district, I managed to be reelected four times, twice with 60% of the vote, even though I was a 100% pro-life voter, even though I, I defended marriage, I was still able to get elected. And I think that exemplifies how electable I am in Northern Virginia without compromising my principles. The second issue that I want to address is the Second Amendment. Because I am very aware that there are those who are talking about one-on-one -on -one and to groups about where I stand on the Second Amendment, and I want to clarify that. Um, I did send a blast email out to our 40 plus thousand email um, list. I don't know that you all saw it, and I know that we can get you copies if you'd like to see what I put out there. But I want to tell you that anything you're hearing that I don't support the Second Amendment or any amendment of the Constitution is absolutely false. I have been a gun owner, 357 Magnum and a Beretta. And I like to share a story. My um, daughter's father was out of town quite a bit. And we had an alarm system in the house. The girls, my four daughters, were in uh, their bedrooms upstairs. And the, the master bedroom was downstairs. The alarm went off in the middle of the night, and the little indicator said back door. And I said, oh, great. Because that back door was between me and the girls. So the first thing I did was go to my safe, pull out the Beretta, and I went around that house looking for the perpetrator. And I'll tell you this. Nobody comes between a mom and Grizzly and her daughters. <laughs> I would have shot first and then worried about it afterwards. And so I am very much as have having been a gun owner and someone that understands the need to protect your family and certainly an advocate of the Second Amendment. I know that it's more than a gun issue, it's also an issue of liberty. And I know that if we allow for um, the Second Amendment to be eroded, then we look to other <coughs> amendments to the Constitution being eroded as well. I will be honest and tell you this. I feel very strongly that we should have an instant background check for everyone who purchases a, a weapon at a gun show. Now the dealers are all required to do that if you purchase from a dealer, but there are three gun shows that I've become aware of that allow private sales within those boundaries. And I think that it's important that we not allow in an openly and uh, advertised event for those to be able to come in and to have access so easily and not have to have an instant background check. And I'd like to share some statistics that recently came out from the Virginia State Police. Virginia State Police statistics show that, oh, about 53,000 people have failed instant background checks. And actually, our state police are very good at enforcing. We hear around the country that enforcement isn't great, but in Virginia they are. They have convicted almost 13,000 individuals who, who failed a background check who attempted to buy from dealers at their shops, at gun shows, and in other venues. Most importantly, Virginia has become very good at adding the mental health data to the instant background check database. And just this past year, 340 individuals were denied the ability to purchase a firearm because they failed due to their mental health background, because that information is on the background check. And so I feel strongly that the instant background check is important at a gun show, not private sales between two individuals. And I think that the statistics from the state police show that it's effective, that it has deterred and forbidden people who should not have access from buying. And so that's, I wanted to clarify that that is my issue. I do not agree with Mike Bloomberg about anything else that he's doing. Um, if you saw the video, or, or if you go on to just say no to Jean Marie, you'll see the video there. If you really take the time to watch it, you will see that the only issue that was discussed is closing the gun show loophole and nothing else. So I wanted to clarify that for you because I know it's very easy for other candidates as they are campaigning and are backbiting behind everybody else's back. I never say anything negative about my opponents. I feel very strongly that if my experience and my electability and my conservative values are not enough to get me nominated, well then I shouldn't be nominated. But I'm not going to denigrate my other um, challengers in order to try to elevate myself. I think that says, speaks volumes about the character of anyone who campaigns that way. So I wanted to clarify that for you so that you know exactly where I stand on that issue. Um, and I think I'll stop there. I've probably gone way past my time. I'm, <coughs> I'm kind of feeling while you wait for Scott. But um, he's on, the, on site. Oh, terrific. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today.